uh, Matt Mitros, and I'm the head of ceramics at the University of Alabama, and I'll be introducing Sydney today. I, <clears throat> I've always found leap year to be very problematic, particularly whenever you're trying to add up some numbers. And I could be off by a day or two, but I think it was 1,146 days ago when I first met Sydney. And this was in Augusta, Georgia. I had a show there, and her professor, Raul, said, you know, this is someone you need to meet. This is someone that may be a, a contributor in your grad program. And so I struck up a conversation with Sydney, and I, and I remember how impressed I was with her delivery and um, the soundness of her ideas. Talent is cheap. Talent, talent is everywhere. We can find that in applications every single year. But if you can find someone who's talented and has the ability to sort of extend their brain into a place that they're not comfortable, and then within that realm of discomfort to make discoveries. And that's what Sydney's really, really capable of. Plus, uh, my four-year-old son, he told me one day, he said, I love Sydney. And I said, well, why do you love her? And he said, because she's so smart. And so I rely on him now. You may not know that, Sydney. I've kind of kept that from you for a while. Um, I rely on him now for all judgments and assessments with our grad program. <laughs> Sydney is going to, I'm, I'm looking at her talk right now, and um, she is going to talk to us about artifacts of identity. And I've, I've listened to some drafts of this speech, this talk, and um, I don't know if I understand it, but it makes perfect sense. And I think that's the wonderful thing about art, is that um, there's this sort of parallel opportunity to um, process information. And uh, Sydney is going to present to you today a wealth of information. It's a great honor to welcome you, Sydney, and uh, it's all you. a lot to live up to. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, my name is Sydney Eworth and uh, I am a MFA candidate at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. Um, I am nearing the completion of my degree and uh, as I considered this presentation I couldn't help but think of a moment during one of my first year faculty reviews. Um, a professor commented on the body of work that I was trying to defend stating that what I was presented looked like a one-man juried art show. Um, in all fairness, they might be right. Um, I have a lot of different interests, a lot of different avenues, and today I'm going to be talking about clay, mapping, shadows, book bags, and a lot of other things, all while trying to convince you that there is, in fact, a through line. Um, there are three significant relationships that I want to talk about today. Clay and touch, mark making and action, and shadow and object. To me, these seemingly unrelated things can physically mark something intangible and elusive, leaving behind an artifact of a moment or an object's identity. So artifact and identity. I think it's important to dissect what those two words mean before moving on any further. Um, the image on the left here is a handmade terracotta statue from the cypro archaic era, referencing object as artifact. Um, uh, the image on the right is a picture of a very adorable baby discovering his reflection in the mirror. And I think that that references your perceived identity or discovering your identity. As expressed by its many definitions, an artifact is something uh, that is created by humans, uh, usually for a practical purpose, that is a remnant of a period or a characteristic of a human institution. The definition of identity is a little harder to pin down. Um, Identity could be who someone is, the name of a person, and the characteristics or beliefs that inhabit a person. Identity is also the sameness in all that constitutes the objective reality of a thing. So all at once, identity is the uniqueness of a person, and at the same time uh, expresses the identical oneness of a person, the sameness of a person. Gabriela Roscoe's piece, My Hands Are My Heart, is a great example of the clay touch relationship that I mentioned earlier. Here he took a small lump of clay in his hands and by applying pressure, he squeezed it into the shape of a heart. His fingers leave behind the trace of contact with his hands. This piece to me not only represents the earnest nature of clay, but also of its undeniability to, uh, undeniable ability to record and um, touch. Orozco was suggesting here that the hand and the heart are essentially the same thing. The essence of contact is so important, and clay documents and preserves our interaction with it. <clears throat> 
Um, repetition is part of my process, and while it serves as a meditative sort of lost state for me, I like to think of repetition in relation to touch as a tangible measurement of time. Uh, repetition in, ref in reference to routine or wearing your path into the earth. These images are from a site-specific work I did at Oxbow last summer. And over several days, I worked my way back and forth across the ground, pressing my thumb into these clay coils. I may not have an equation of thumbprint plus x equals time spent, but I leave the evidence of the event through the layers of the material, through building up and through repetition. The touch we leave behind embedded in clay is a trace of our identity in a way. It is, in a sense, um, a way to preserve our experience with the material and prove our presence in the world in that moment. So clay as a material offers a unique opportunity to record through the void of an impression, as well as the objects it can absorb into itself. Um, clay can uh, reject objects and just leave the impression of its interaction with it, and clay can also absorb it and sort of um, hoard objects that it comes in contact with. So these are some uh, pinched plasticine coils that I attached to my own shoes. And uh, after covering the soles of my shoes, I took a walk through the woods to see what the clay would collect on the path. Francis Alice is an, aport, uh, an important artist I believe to reference here. Several of his pieces are based on walking and mapping his journey. The image on the right is uh, the green line. It, this is a piece where he punctured a paint can and walked around Jerusalem, slowly leaking a trail of paint that mapped his entire walk. This was a second iteration of a similar piece called The Leak, which he performed in Paris years earlier. It wasn't until after I made these shoes that I was introduced to his piece, Zapatos Magneticos. During the fifth biennial in Havana, Cuba, he constructed these magnetic shoes and took daily walks through the streets. And while he was walking through the streets, his shoes collected scraps of metal. Needless to say, his shoes lasted a bit longer than mine did, but the imprints and debris of the forest collected by the shoes here made my participation and the presence of the act more palpable to me. The, the shoes required my action and touch to gather the pre-existing artifacts of this journey. Um, the plasticine shoes became an artifact of the walk through the woods, but they're just a consequence of the experience. Without the performance, they exist as an object that offers only part of the story. So I wanted to use the clay to map an entire experience through interaction and the impressions left behind. Um, this is a large clay slab that I used as a yoga mat, and the mat recorded the impression of my body as I moved through the yoga routine, expressing preservation through action as the clay captured my movement through my touch. This sl the slab in relation to the body um, is a vulnerable mass that is imprinted with reality through movement and weight. The imprint is a map of my body as presence and action. This brings me to the second relationship I mentioned, action and mark making. Matthew Barney's drawing restraint series explored the, uh, using the body in action to make marks. A review of this series stated that Barney's exploration of the body draws upon an athletic model of development in which growth occurs only through restraint. The muscle encounters resistance, becomes engorged and is broken down, and in healing becomes stronger. The way the muscle develops in response to interacting with resistance fuels his self-imposed and elaborate obstacles to literally restrain him from drawing. His body plays the principal role in providing tension and physicality in these pieces. This particular image is a still from drawing restraint number six, where he's jumping on a tilted trampoline in an attempt to make marks on the ceiling. His work is performative and active as he enacts ritualistic processes of making through harnessing his own impulses. I attempted to track my movement by building what I've been calling my drawing book bag. It's made up of a box with book bag straps that contains a piece of paper and pieces of pastel or charcoal suspended with string. With the backpack on, I give myself tasks or challenges to perform, such as jumping up and down 300 times or bending at the waist over and over. Using isolated and repeated movements, I can track what I'm doing through an indirect way of mark making. <laughs> 
The goal was to generate a physical sign or trace of motion as the drawings serve as a tangible sign or proof of presence in, my, in that moment. By setting up these parameters for the movement and the numbers of times that I enacted it, the drawings serve as maps of the particular movement's inherent nature, while also making frenetic marks that represent the time spent performing the movement. The drawing is an inaccurate representation of what actually took place, though. Um, for example, the, defi the devastation of an earthquake in relation to uh, the corresponding seismograph. Images of any um, earthquake or uh, devastation like that um, isn't reflected in the seismograph. It's really underwhelming in the chart. Um, but the chart is accurate in recording what happened. I find that there's a disconnect between recorded data and the actual impact of an event or experience. In this instance, the drawings on their own have a more atmospheric and almost serious quality to me, and the performative aspect of making them is really silly and illogical. The movement and action that occurs to make the drawings is a fleeting experience, and the character of that event resides within the drawing that it is produced from. William Anastasi is another artist that explores mark making through indirect but intentional constructs. In one review, his work was said to investigate autonomy and representational function of art objects, as he calls into question aesthetic norms, medium specificity, and phenomenological relations. He has several series that start um, with specific tasks that he set out for himself. One of these avenues of drawing are his uh, intuited blind drawings. So during these, he blindfolds himself or closes his eyes and allows the music playing to direct his movement and in turn his mark making. He also makes these walking drawings and subway drawings. On the subway, he'll lay a piece of paper on his lap and limply hold pencils in his hands hovering over the paper. And during his walks, he'll clutch a paper folded around a piece of graphite or charcoal in his pocket. During um, one interview, he said, when, when there's motion, let that motion, rather than predetermination, be the energy for the drawing, rather than consulting the aesthetic prejudice of the moment, which we usually do when we draw with our eyes open. So during these, he uses the movement of the subway or his path while he's walking to dictate the motion of his hand. These drawings reflect a naive yet sincere registration in the articulations of the body and in the pursuit of questioning mark making. Formally, I enjoy the scribble aesthetic in these drawings. They have a raw energy that's sort of sharp and playful simultaneously and that I can't re recreate with intentional and direct mark making. The physicality and performative aspect utilized in the intent um, in the parameter set while offering the opportunity for chance to cons contextualize the expressiveness of the mark and the artifact aftermath of the action. Unlike the relationship between clay and touch and mark making and action, the relationship between an object and a shadow, shadow is almost non-negotiable. If you can think about it in terms of cause and effect, you squeeze a ball of clay and that results in your impression of your hand and the material. Um, if you uh, jump up and down 300 times with a drawing book bag on your back. Um, that will result in marks on the paper. But if the action is absent in those things, um, then the artifact and, and the identity in which the artifact adheres itself to are two very abstract things. While a gnarled hand in front of a light may look very different than a puppy dog projected onto the wall, the void is consistent in, seam in seamlessly echoing its light blocker as a silhouette. The shadow of an object serves as a featureless silhouette, void of any detail inside the solid shape. Before the advent of photography, silhouette profiles were an inexpensive way of documenting someone's ex um, appearance. Silhouettes are used for practical purposes, such as road signs or maps, where you need to identify an image clearly and quickly. Um, ref referring to our confusing definition of identity that I mentioned earlier, your shadow is unique to you. Um, but it also is a, it, it relates to the sameness of every, everyone else's shadow. 
When I began making work based around the relationship of the shadow and the object, I relied heavily on Charles Pierce's theory of semiotics to provide a framework. Just to quickly break this down, he dissects the relationship between a sign and an object using the term sign as the evidence of something's existence. So for example, in the relationship between the smoke and the flame, the flame would be the object and the smoke would be the proof of that flame's presence in that moment. It would be an artifact of the flame existing. So at the time, this theory fascinated me and helped me to better navigate why I liked the relationship between objects and their shadows. I started to think about how distance can provide more room for interpretation in a cause and effect relationship between two things. The trace shadow drawings rely on the light source not only to determine their form, but to bring about a measurable physical object. Visually, the shadow shapes are ambiguous, but in relation to the object, they imply direction and movement. Confusing the logic of the light and eventually removing the object from its shadow entirely was an important step for the work I'm making now in recognizing that the sculpture is just a catalyst for the silhouette shadow drawing. The object and the shadow can have identity separate from each other. So what the hell does all of this mean? Perhaps the one-man juried art show comment wasn't that far off. These relationships in my mind reference the evidence of the proof of your presence. The impressions recorded from the touch in clay, the marks made through activating a mark maker, the shape of a traced shadow, these are all artifacts that serve to map a moment or an identity. The ability to record and trace relates to mapping. Mapping stems from a need to locate ourselves in the world, a thirst for knowledge or control, um, and a longing to connect and explore. I'm interested in what we can learn about the object's identity in relation to our own by using this shadow to echo and expand the identity of the original artifact. In my mind, this work is starting to reference two different types of space. One is what I'm calling the lived in or occupied space. This is the place where sculptures exist, where we exist, a shared space that we all inhabit. The lived space refers to our tangible existence in reality. The other is an imagined space. This is where the shadows and the idea that the shadow represents our memory and its capaci capacity to become distorted over time, um, like a personal space. The shadow is a silhouette of an object became a general approximation of the object's perceived or projected identity. These artifacts can help to bridge the gap between lived and imagined space by aesthetically translating a tangible record of a fragment of a moment or action. My newer work incorporates the artifacts and the identity they're referencing in a way that celebrates the identity, um, the echo that can, it, it can be separate from its object. Collaging and rearranging the fragments from these relationships is the catalyst in forming a new narrative. I enjoy the juxtaposition of different visual languages, like the immediacy of tracing and drawing a, mix, drawing a shadow mixed with the impression and the weight of clay. I still consider the artifacts as a representation of the generalized idea of self or characteristics of a moment, but they are abstracted and open to interpretation as they are placed and rearranged into different settings. While nondescript, the new dialogue formed by these visual cues has a silly and absurd quality that I think reference my own identity. Collaging these elements feels like decorating, but I'm learning to relish gratuity through celebration of material, form, and color. My work has become somewhat pictorial as crude, amorphous shapes mixed with plastic and bright materials start to divulge a story about sprucing up things that are left behind. In their new context, the forms start to resemble fantastical structures and absurd imaginary architecture. This piece depicts an iteration of a shadow, depicted three-dimensionally and outlining the edge of the shadow rather than a solid void. So the linear element projects a new shadow, like an echo of an echo, a shadow of a shadow of a shadow. I wanted to explore lived and imagined space again, but through the idea of monuments and containment. 
through collaging and collecting various objects together, I want to continue to talk about how I can construct an environment made up of animated and active objects. Humor, color, and absurd form are all tools of deflection for me. Silly animated forms are being used as a shield to protect and preserve the self. I'm starting to realize that while I work intuitively with color and texture, the decisions about color are referencing protection and preservation. Like warning coloration in nature, day glow yellow and obnoxious textures act like a counterintuitive camouflage, like hiding in plain sight. <coughs> These relationships are about making marks of the temporal, the ephemeral, and creating physical tokens or keepsakes from a moment. In my experience, we move through life collecting and discarding things that resonate with our ever-changing identity. We also leave involuntary impressions of ourselves on our surroundings, <coughs> excuse me, that act as remnants of our presence in that moment. The pursuit of a creative lifestyle is a conscious choice to record your mark on the world. As romantic and su superfluous as that might be, I truly believe that artists are essential in helping to map a cultural landscape, using the things we leave behind as a proof of our presence or artifacts of our identity. Thank you. I have no idea what time we're at, but do we take questions? Five minutes? Do you guys have any questions? Comments? Concerns? Yes. Um, well, I'm thinking of these uh, tangible artifacts, like um, the void left in you pushing your thumb into clay as sort of like a snapshot. And this may be a stretch, but um, I've certainly experienced like thinking about an event <coughs> and then um, being told years later that it didn't actually happen that way or looking at a photograph and being like, oh, I didn't have braces when I was that age. And so like these physical markers that you interact with in life can sort of like be a reminder of what actually happened versus like how over time your memory starts to warp your your memory. <laughs> um, I think your experience, yeah, I think it does. But I think that um, it's just an interesting thing to me to think about your identity is made up of your experiences and your memories and how those can potentially be warped. And so your identity might not be true or maybe it's true to you. I don't know if that makes sense. That might be just like a cyclical argument. Yeah. Have you ever tried to preserve the pieces? Like the yoga mat or the shoes by fire? Um, some, some of them, yes, because I build a lot in that like repetitive coil making, but those particular pieces, um, just ended up being reclaimed or like washed away into the landscape. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and I think it's a really, I mean, honestly, sometimes I confuse myself when I'm like talking about these things that mark who we are and our identity, but I think both of them are, are valid, and I think that they're both something that I'm trying to talk about and explore through my work, for sure. Yeah. 
Um, I, words definitely, word, words and writing definitely influence the, some of the things that I make. <clears throat> and um, honestly, other times, I keep like the, that notebook app on my phone is just full of like, well, it, just where you can write down, yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, certain things that people say or just like certain words that sort of like make my ears perk up, um, I'll write down. And I think that I'm really jealous of like, of writers, like I'm not a very good writer, but words are really interesting to me. And m more so the fragments of sentences, the fragments of words. Um, I think when I'm thinking about titles, a lot of times I'm not, the work that I'm making isn't for like a specific narrative. It's not saying like, this is a story that I'm trying to tell. Um, so I think that a lot of the titles that I'm interested in are sort of like fragments of a sentences, like something that trails off, which is like kind of, I, I tend to trail off in the middle of sentences sometimes. Um, the comedian Louis C.K. did a, he, he made a really funny joke about like, like, is this too high? Like, how do you stay, you know, like I just, I'm interested in like things that are just like a little bit off. Like when you're talking to someone and they're like, how are you? And you're like, nothing much. Like that, like disconnect. Um, so I think that writing does influence, but um, not in a super direct way. Like this title means that it's this narrative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm trying to understand so what. Um, interested? Yes. Do I have a? I I think that that's a really good question. It's still something that I'm thinking about and trying to define, but it seems like identity is so multidimensional. Like it can be these like physical artifacts, like your thumbprint, or it can be like the fact that you are believe in this specific religious thing, or it can be, you know, something that like your identity to someone else could be totally different than what you think of yourself as, like how, like an identifier, if that makes sense. So I think it, um, it's fluid. It feels really fluid and it feels um, like I'm, I, I think I w I'm interested in it, but I'm still trying to ex like figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one one more question. Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> I think so. Um, I think because okay, like the drawings, some that if you were to see that, I don't think that that would be a Webster's definition of what jumping up and down three hundred times looks like. But it's still the consequence and the result of that action. So, yes, I think I think so, kind of. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thank you guys so much. Yeah.